Coming up on 2020 on ID. A popular preacher, devoted family man, until his wife's sudden death. She's not breathing at all, no pulse or anything. He says it was suicide. I loved her. She's the mother of my children. But whom to believe, him or his mistress? He said that their sex life had been lacking. Lust, lies, and the blonde's bombshell. He said that he couldn't stand how fat she had gotten. Said that he wanted her out of his life. It was incredibly sad. And one family's words of warning. Don't mess with our family. Don't mess with us. We will fight for the truth. The Hidden Life of the Preacher. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. He was a preacher who couldn't resist temptation. Caught between two women. The one he married and the one he desired. So when his wife was found dead in their locked bedroom, her suspicious relatives vowed to find out the truth. As Jim Avila first reported in 2010, was it suicide or murder? A favorite son in Waco, Texas. That you may fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, the Baptist preacher with a doting congregation and a beautiful family. If, if you know our children or not, it's my wife, Carrie, and it's special for me. Matt Baker, front and center at the pulpit every Sunday in the heart of the Bible Belt. Hey, with 911, do you have an emergency? Uh, yes, yeah, I think my wife just committed suicide. Pastor Baker never imagined himself in this life-changing moment, pounding his wife's chest in the middle of the night on the phone to 911 and reading a suicide note out of the corner of his eye. Tell me exactly what happened. Um, I, my wife is laying in the bed uh -huh. and her lips are blue, are, are, are cold, and there's a note that says I'm sorry, basically. Is she conscious? No, she's she not. Breathing? No, 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 no. She's not breathing at all, no pulse or anything. She was not moving, no response. And I, I shake her, I call her name, and Wow, what do I do? And I uh, put my head to her chest and didn't see or feel her chest rising, no, no air coming out, felt for pulse, nothing. I get her dressed as I'm on the phone. And Did you see what happened to her? No, 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 I do not know. The sweet life for Pastor Baker and his 31-year-old wife, Carrie, had come to a sudden stop. The college sweethearts who married within months of their first hellos, both educated at Baylor University, cornerstone of Baptist education, and raising a family bathed in piety and love. The perfect couple from day one. It was almost an immediate attraction. We liked each other, we fell in love with each other. Carrie's family thought it all happened too fast, but were reassured by their daughter that Matt was a good man, and being a preacher in Bible-thumping country certainly helped. It was a whirlwind romance. Carrie's mother, Linda Doolin. We tried to talk Carrie into waiting a little longer and she really did not want to. So Carrie Baker's Aunt Nancy says the family went along with the rapid fire romance. After all, she was marrying a Baptist minister. How good is that? Matt and Carrie's life together looked so promising until without warning on that spring night, the preacher's wife brought it all to an abrupt end snuffing out the storybook romance they authorities with a couple of wine coolers and a bottle of sleeping pills. Oh, she's got foam or something coming out of her nose. Okay, someone's at the front door. I gotta go. Those moments stay in your mind. You can't, you can't get them out. A loving husband with big blue eyes and a prominent position. Carrie had it all, including a rewarding career of her own. Wow! Wow! <laughs> as a devoted mother and elementary school teacher. She was always the bubbly little blonde, cheerleader, mascot in high school, loved athletics, loved life. People were drawn to Carrie, always. So why would a perfectly healthy mother of two leave a typed, unsigned suicide note professing love for her children, her parents, and her husband, say she is sorry, and then take her own life? She didn't come at me and say, Matt, I'm going to kill myself. But Matt says there were clues that his beautiful wife was in a downward spiral. 
It began, he says, with one monumental tragedy. I love you. The loss of their second daughter, a little girl who lit up their world. Her name was Cassidy, and she struggled mightily for life. Struck by a brain tumor at a year old, taken from her parents just four months later. And everyone agrees her death drove her mother, Carrie, to bouts of terrible grief. I didn't think she was depressed. I thought it was just a deep sadness. She had a hole in her heart. It was horrible. She made it through her faith. Her faith was a very big part. But Matt says Carrie never really made it entirely through the grief and says her treasured leather-bound Bible, a gift from Matt, is filled with clues to how deep the sadness was. In the margins around some of her favorite scriptures, evidence, says Matt, that Carrie was hiding dark thoughts of ending her earthly life in favor of a heavenly one with the daughter she lost seven years before. There's one in 2 Samuel where David loses his firstborn child and she writes on the bottom, Cassidy, I will go to her. And what does this tell you? She could never let go of Cassidy. It was such a strong hold on her. Carrie did go to a grief counselor for a year. Matt claims she began seeing a therapist again the week of her death and to a doctor complaining of stress and anxiety. Matt says her once close relationship with her two daughters suffered as Carrie, he says, pulled away. There was constantly that in, in her voice and in her prayers and in our conversations that, what if? I lost one, what if we lose another one? I can't handle that. The night she died, Matt told investigators about Carrie's depression. They quickly decided that suicide made sense. But almost immediately, some of those closest to Carrie, like her cousin Lindsay Pick, who showed up at the Baker house in her pajamas while police were still on the scene, could not comprehend how the doting mom could leave her kids. They believe suicide was not in Carrie's character. She had other children, including a daughter born just a year and a half after Cassidy died. She would have never, ever left her children. And with that, the women who knew Carrie best, her cousin and aunts, decided they would not accept that suicide ruling. This just came out of nowhere. There's no way Carrie would have done this. We knew she did not take her own life. Don't mess with our family. Don't mess with us. We will fight for the truth. Her family decided they would fight by launching their own investigation, hiring experts, and pushing so hard, friends began to call them the Charlie's Angels of Waco, Texas. Linda finally said, I need my angels over here so we can talk. When we return, Charlie's Angels get the results the police had not even thought to look for. When was the aha moment for you? When I saw the phone calls to Vanessa Bowles. The avenging angels uncover the other woman and the secret life of Waco's golden boy minister. We'll be right back. Matt Baker has lost his wife to a sudden surprising suicide. But he seems to be recovering quite well. Once again, here's Jim Avila. These photos were taken just two weeks after Carrie Baker was buried. It's Matt and Carrie's oldest daughter's 10th birthday. And celebrating it right beside Matt is the new woman in his life. That's him with his arm around her in this picture. Carrie's family says within days, Matt had replaced Carrie with Vanessa Bull. So I just decided to just go over there and knock on the door. Carrie's cousin Lindsay and her sister Andy surprised Matt with a visit one day in the weeks after her death. We noticed there weren't any pictures of Carrie up in the house at all. The only picture we saw in the house was of Vanessa and the girls on the refrigerator. But Carrie's mother Linda just wanted everyone to let it go and grieve. But then a revelation comes in the mail. A simple cell phone bill changes everything. What jumps off the page to Linda Doolin is that Carrie is dead, but her cell phone lives on. It's in the hands of a new woman, and Matt is on the phone with her constantly. Matt had given Carrie's cell phone to someone, and I immediately figured out it was Vanessa Bowles because her number was on there. And what that told me was something wasn't right 
Matt's story wasn't right. We're here to help Matthew Baker today. So while Matt Baker was receiving the sympathy of his community, the innocent victim of now two tragedies, an infant daughter who died in her crib after a serious illness, and his wife who committed suicide, the Charlie's Angels are building a case that this preacher is not the innocent most people thought him to be. Exhibit A, this woman, once a classmate of Matt Baker. I was afraid of him. I was angry with him. He took away my young adulthood. Carrie's relatives tracked down Laura Wilson, who had filed a complaint against Matt when she was a freshman in the early 1990s. Both worked in the athletic department as trainers, where she says Matt sexually assaulted her. He didn't stop with the kiss. He didn't stop with the touching until he was ready to stop. We confronted Matt Baker with the incident. He remembers it as the total fantasy of an hysterical co-ed. All I can tell you is when she left the facility, was in tears, but nothing that I did. 2020 was able to document several other complaints against Matt Baker, from a female custodian at the First Baptist Church of Waco, who says he grabbed her sexually, and a teenage girl at the same church complained that Matt made improper sexual advances. At his next job at the YMCA in Waco, where he supervised the day camp, Matt was fired after four young women complained to management of improper sexual conduct. Can there be things that have been said that misconstrued possible? But never once did I solicit sex from them. And now the Charlie's Angels say that Matt's double life was the motive behind what they believe is not a suicide, but Carrie's murder. You know, he had a girlfriend. Carrie was in his way. I wasn't interested in dating. I don't think there was ever an interest in that because I was happily married. I'm married. That's, that's what I believe. I don't believe in adultery. I don't believe in divorce. He never loved Carrie. I don't believe he's capable of love. Do you think Carrie figured that out near the end? Yes, I do. Carrie told me they were having problems. And that makes me really sad. <laughs> because my child never knew what it was to be loved by her husband. Carrie's family is on Matt's tail. Just a month after she is buried, they watch as Matt replaces Carrie with Vanessa more and more publicly. And he took her to Kinsey or Gracie's graduation up at the elementary school. Oh, looking I mean. for engagement rings. The Charlie's Angels investigation turns up more stunning evidence. Carrie's therapist comes forward to reveal that Matt's wife suspected he was having an affair and she feared he was out to get rid of her. Carrie had shared with her that she was afraid that Matt was might possibly try to kill her and that she'd also found some pills, some crushed pills in Matt's briefcase. You know those words are probably going to hurt you. Which words? Words from a counselor saying, Carrie told me she was afraid her husband was going to kill her. Well, I guess if the counselor believed that, why would she not have done more? The tiny Hewitt Police Department, which handles one murder every eight years, had none of this information before walking away from the crime scene that night, believing suicide. And when Linda Doolin tried to give it to the Hewitt Police Chief in person, she says he had no interest and rudely turned her away. He said, if you are here to hash over the same old thing, you are wasting your time. The family was highly critical of the Hewitt Police Department's investigation. One lone detective took just a handful of crime scene pictures. CSI techs were not called to the scene. Virtually no evidence was collected. No blood was taken from Carrie to see if and how many drugs were in her system. The justice of the peace, who didn't even bother to get out of bed, made the suicide ruling over the phone without an autopsy. So Charlie's Angels hired their own investigators, who find more critical evidence on Matt's computers tracking websites, they find the preacher was looking up information on sleeping pill poisoning. I did research to see, can you overdose? Is that even a possibility that I need to worry about? My wife overdosing on sleeping pills. Matt Baker's attorney concedes all the swirling stories and circumstantial evidence add up to an uphill fight for his client. And I know that you can be convicted without any specific proof. There is no cause of death, there is no forensic proof, but we gotta fight like hell. And for nearly four years, that's where it stands. 
two bickering families in a stalemate of justice. Matt Baker lives his new life, firm in his denial. I have to ask you, did you kill your wife? I did not kill my wife. I did not hurt my wife. But when we return, a break in the case. This lawman sets a trap for the other woman, and she's running scared. If you help me, then I'll be glad to help you. But if you don't, I'm going to take you down with him. Stay with us. It's almost two years since Carrie Baker disappeared from this idyllic picture. A healthy 31-year-old woman with two adorable girls. Her death ruled a surprising suicide. Carrie's husband, Matt, a Baptist pastor, under suspicion by her family, which launches its own investigation, while Matt remains the innocent, free dad, caring for Kenzie and Grace at his parents' home four hours from Waco. It's okay, put the L beside it. Under constant scrutiny by his in-laws, who tell everyone, including Texas Monthly Magazine, that he murdered his wife. She was my best friend. Matt goes on the very public defensive, scheduling a series of interviews to counter the charges from Carrie's family. His first national exposure is on 2020. Could you do this? There's no way I could ever hurt my wife. I loved her. She's the mother of my children. And like every marriage, you have your ups and your downs. You have your good days and your bad days. But I loved her and I miss her, and I did not hurt my wife. Matt had lost his preacher's job. He and the girls supported themselves out of the generosity of his parents and their church, which held fundraisers. His attorney, Guy James Gray, even donated his otherwise very expensive services. I thought it was kind of a witch hunt, really. A mother of a, had lost a child, and she was on a campaign for justice. I talked to Matt Baker's attorney today. He told me his client did not murder his wife. And The defense strategy of going public appeared to be working. There was no indictment. Carrie's family kept at it, but in meeting after meeting with police and prosecutors, they were told even with the cell phone records and the new woman in Matt's life, even with the computer searches about Ambien poisoning, they were not going to prosecute a preacher with a clean record unless they had a slam dunk case. Assistant District Attorney Crawford Long handled those meetings. That must be a difficult conversation for a prosecutor to have, Oh, right? surely it is. Uh, you never like to uh, uh, tell a family member that you're going to have to wait. Carrie's family did make some progress. They asked for and got a coroner's inquest, exhuming her body, conducting the autopsy and toxicology tests not performed in the days immediately after her death. But because Carrie's body had been embalmed, the tests were inconclusive. But there was one big success. The inquest changed the cause of death from suicide to undetermined. Carrie Lynn Baker's manner and cause of death shall be recorded as undetermined. A small victory that encouraged Carrie's parents to file a wrongful death suit in civil court against Matt Baker. And he was put under oath in this tape deposition by their attorneys. What did you observe when you first opened that door? Uh, my wife naked laying on the bed. Carrie's family hoped suing him would unlock hidden evidence and prompt a criminal indictment. But still, it did not come. And Matt Baker continued life as a free man three years after Carrie's death. I think a lot of people thought that, you know, the case was sitting on a shelf somewhere. We were actively doing things like the DNA, the fingerprinting, talking to the pathologist, uh, doing everything we could. Still, not enough. Nothing worked. Until... Finally, we turned to Vanessa Bulls, the uh, alleged girlfriend, and uh, we have an investigator who's uh, been very talented in getting people to confess to things, Abden Rodriguez. I picked up a lot of red flags during the interview from she not telling me the truth. Abden Rodriguez is a cop's cop, not flashy, sort of an Hispanic Columbo. Looks like he was never born to wear a suit but he has a way of earning confidence of those for whom he is working. Abden Rodriguez always knew she knew everything. He always did. And more importantly, he often strikes fear into those whom he is investigating, not with threats, but by knowing the facts. Before his interviews with Vanessa Bulls, he took meticulous notes in his pad. 
and called her on any little mistake or lie. I told her, I'm going to gather enough information to indict Matt Baker, and if you help me, then I'll be glad to help you. But if you don't, then I'm going to take you down with him. Still, in interview after interview, Vanessa Bulls stonewalled. She never admitted to an affair. She never admitted to affairs. She never admitted to having any knowledge of the murder. But then Rodriguez sets a trap, tells Vanessa over and over he does not believe her story, and warns her that a secret grand jury was being formed, and the stakes were high if she lied there. So when Vanessa Bulls was subpoenaed to testify, Abdin Rodriguez strategically placed himself and his conspicuous notepad outside the courtroom making her worry he could prove she was lying. It was all a bluff. She didn't know what information I had. She was afraid she was going to get arrested. Prosecutor Susan Schaefer was in the grand jury room with her partner Crawford Long. Neither knew what to expect until Vanessa gave Susan a small sign as she strode to the witness stand. As she walked in the door, she looked at me and touched my arm and said, I'm ready. And I wondered at that point if she was about to say something that she'd never told us before. Crawford Long missed that moment at the doorway, never expecting what was to come. Before I was getting ready to let her go, I just said, uh, has he ever told you anything about uh, Carrie Baker's death? And she said, yes, he told me he killed her because of me. All of a sudden, she just came out and, bang, okay, he killed her, and he told me that he killed her for me, and this, and that, and that. And, and, I mean, everybody was shocked. I was shocked, too. Probably my jaw dropped down and hit my chest. And just like that, three years of investigation finally paid off. So the day that Vanessa Bulls is forthright is the day you take the case. That very day to the same grand jury. Within hours, Linda Doolin is notified by the district attorney's office that Charlie's Angels have gotten their wish. She said, Linda, as we speak, Right now, they are indicting Matt Baker. And I said, oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. Even now, it just overwhelms me. The golden boy preacher is under arrest, betrayed by his new girlfriend. But wait till you hear what she says in court. He said, will you really date your pastor? And I just, I didn't say anything. I just kind of looked at him. He said, well, he said, um, I've had a vasectomy, so I can't get you pregnant. Also, I don't have any STDs. Vanessa Bulls takes the stand, and we take you there for her shocking testimony when we come back. And we have breaking news for you now concerning that case of a former preacher accused of murdering his... March 25th, 2009, almost a full three years after Carrie Baker was found nearly naked and thoroughly dead in the master bedroom suite of her Waco, Texas home. Her husband, Matt, is finally under arrest and charged with her murder. Matt's accused of drugging and suffocating her and then making her death appear to be a suicide. Waco's preacher was now in the eyes of police and prosecutors, the murdering minister, briefly put behind bars but released on bond to help prepare for the trial of his life. All because the woman he may have killed for, the woman who protected him and lied to police for him time after time, had flipped and was now the star witness for the prosecution. There's a, an old saying, if you're going to prosecute the devil, you may have to go to hell for your witnesses. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you give in this matter to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. She dressed plainly for court, not the devil with the blue dress on as she takes the stand. But she is seething, aware that her story may not only convict her former lover, it will surely make her look very bad as well. I could possibly lose my job because of this. Ever since he got released from jail, I sleep with a crystal nail file next to my bed. Yes, I am scared of him, but I'm saying things right right now. Vanessa Bulls, a 24-year-old striking blonde single mom, seven years younger and importantly enough to Matt Baker, she says, perhaps 80 pounds lighter than his wife. He referred to her as a fat bitch, said that he couldn't stand how fat she had gotten, said that he wanted her out of his life. Vanessa and Matt started their affair about two months before Carrie died. Vanessa, daughter of the music director at Pastor Baker's Crossroad Church, 
had just been through a painful divorce, and she says Matt saw his chance at seduction. He would start saying things like, you know, oh, you're, you're so gorgeous, and said whoever finds you is going to be a lucky man. Flirting, she says, at every opportunity. He came by and was kind of smiling. He said, oh, don't date other guys. Just date your pastor. After that, um, there was some kind of church potluck. I was outside getting some food, and he started walking down the hallway, and he kind of motioned for me to walk down that way. He said, will you really date your pastor? And I just, I didn't say anything. I just kind of looked at him. He said, well, he said, um, I've had a vasectomy, so I can't get you pregnant. Also, I don't have any STDs. The hook was set for the pastor with a roving eye and he pulled her in with a smooth combination of sympathy and compatibility, constantly bringing up the death of his daughter Cassidy and complaining that since then, the love had gone out of his marriage. He said that their sex life had been lacking, that he no longer felt love from her anymore. Then one Friday in March, Matt's day off with Carrie at work, Vanessa says he convinced her to come to the house for some in-person counseling. He asked if he could hold my hands to pray, and he did. Then afterwards, he started to kiss me. Where did things progress from there? Then he just took my hand and led me to the bedroom. They had sex in the marital bed, the same place Carrie would die just a month later. That was the point in my life I wasn't thinking straight. So are you trying to make excuses now for the decisions that you made then? Absolutely not. I own everything. Vanessa does say she could not believe she had become the other woman and felt terrible. But she says Matt Baker, her preacher, was right there to console her with these telling words. He started saying, it's okay, don't feel bad, just ask God to forgive you, it's okay. And he said, in reality, he said, I don't think God believes that anyone can just be with one person the rest of their lives. And very quickly, says Matt's new paramour, he began openly plotting Carrie's death planning, she says, to hide behind her alleged depression and fake a suicide attempt. He said that she took sleeping pills every night, so maybe he could make it look like she overdosed on sleeping pills. He talked initially about maybe putting something in a milkshake. Okay. Did he talk about any other ideas he had? Mm -hmm. He talked about making it look like she'd hung herself, maybe um, having her hanging somewhere. He talked about tampering with the brakes of her car. He had talked about maybe doing a drive-by shooting. Chilling testimony and very hard for Carrie Baker's mother, who was right there sitting through it all, flinching from the matter-of-fact details about plotting her daughter's death and yet silently rooting Vanessa on. What I saw from Vanessa's testimony was a man who was much more evil than even I believed he was. And the worst was still to come. Vanessa Bull says Matt told her he tried the milkshake idea, but the Ambien he put in her drink had a strong taste. He sent an email and said she did not drink the drink. He said she took a sip of it and said that it tasted like lead. And so then he said he took a drink and said, oh, well, the ice cream must have been bad. Shockingly, Matt Baker, she says, then told her he was not finished. He was determined to kill his wife, and his mistress knew all about it beforehand. So you were somewhat implicit in all of this. For keeping my mouth shut and not doing the right thing, yes, I was. And then Vanessa Bulls, the other woman, took Carrie's mother, Linda, the jury, and the courthouse right into the crime scene. Kids sleeping in the room, mom and dad down the hall behind closed doors. And what did he tell you happened that night? He said earlier that day he had gotten big horse pills, which were sex stimulus pills. He said he had, they were capsules that you could open. He told me he put a load of Ambien in there that he crushed up. He said he bought some handcuffs and some other toys like that. He said he handcuffed her to the bed, started kissing her and touching her all over until she fell asleep. He said then, he said he kissed her on the forehead and either said, give Cassidy a hug for me or give Cassidy a kiss for me. Then he said he got the pillow and put it over her face. He said that he thought she was dead. Then a couple of seconds later, she just took one big gasp for air and that he said, oh, 
And then he showed me his hand. He said he put the pillow on her face, but then he said he did this with his hand where her nose was, where her nose and mouth were. He said he did this area tighter so he would be sure to suffocate her. Finally, Carrie was not moving. No breath, no heartbeat. And then Vanessa says Matt told her he finished the plot on the couple's bedroom computer. He said he typed out the suicide note, printed it. Then he said he ran her hand all around the sides of it and put her fingerprints all over it in case they checked for fingerprints. Then he said that he locked the door and left. From the woman Matt had wanted to be his replacement wife, damning firsthand testimony. But would it be enough for the jury? All right, bring in the jury. That was probably the hardest part of the whole trial for me was her. She just had lied so many times, and I'm just one of those once a liar, always a liar. When we return. Matt Baker is on trial for the murder of his wife, Carrie. The other woman in his life has already testified he plotted her death. But will it be enough to convict him. Once again, here's Jim Avila. Twenty twenty didn't choose this music. Matt did. This two thousand five hit song is literally the soundtrack to Matt Baker's hidden affair with Vanessa Bulls. It's titled "Dirty Little Secret." And Matt's mistress testified that's what she became. He sent me song lyrics, I'll keep you my dirty little secret. Don't tell anyone or you'll be just another regret. Matt's replacement woman, Vanessa, says she didn't realize how dirty and how dangerous a secret she was keeping until the morning after Carrie's death. I was shocked because I think a part of me thought that maybe he wouldn't go through with it. We got in the car and we went to the Doolins to offer our condolences and as we left, he was taking his daughter, Grace, outside, and as we drove by, I looked out the backseat and waved, and he winked at me. Matt and Vanessa's love affair was now off to the races, say prosecutors. They went shopping for engagement rings. Call to the stand, K Jewelry Store clerk, Heather Sigler. She tried on about four or five rings, um, asked his opinion. He was asking someone behind the jewelry counter about a trade-in and how much he could possibly get a discount on, the, on another ring. But the affair soon came to an end when Vanessa had second thoughts about both Matt and the cover-up. She broke up with him on the phone. I told him I never wanted to see you again. And he became my rape. He started saying, I killed my wife for you, and now you're leaving. As much as Vanessa's testimony sounded like a slam dunk for prosecutors, the jury told 2020, what this school teacher with a dirty little secret feared would happen did. She was despicable and hard to believe. Four person Kim Wohler. I had a hard time believing Vanessa Bulls. But there's independent evidence to back up Vanessa's story. First, her account about Matt Baker's attempt on his wife's life with the poison milkshake. It was corroborated by an email the preacher sent her. Oh, well, the ice cream must have been bad. The email from Matt says he'll put more chocolate in it next time. How would she know that Carrie liked chocolate milkshakes if he hadn't told her what she said was kind of proven by the emails? The jury says Matt's own voice helped them make their decision. Do I need to go unlock the front door? We couldn't hear any change of inflection when he was doing uh, CPR. I need to get a hold of her parents. And since then, I've actually tried to do CPR and such and talk at the same time, and I can't do it without you hearing it in my voice. In that period of time when he should have been doing the CPR, a uh, 197-pound woman and dead weight, and he was dressing her, it just didn't seem possible. The jury deliberated long into the night. Can it arise? But in the end, it took them just eight hours to decide Matt Baker's fate. We, the jury, find the defendant, Matt D. Baker, guilty of the offense of murder as alleged in the indictment. The sentence, 65 years in prison, a verdict and future that seemed to stun Matt Baker. I truly believe in my innocence. I believe the jury made a mistake in this. 
That's all the minister who told his story in magazines and on television ever said to the jury. He never took the stand. Matt, any comment on the verdict? Any comment on the verdict? Anything to say, Matt? Anything to say, But now, Pastor Baker regrets his silence and sat down with 2020 after the guilty verdict to admit he made two big mistakes, cheating on his wife and lying about it. I'm coming clean on the, the lying about Vanessa. I made a mistake. I'm human. I was having a, a tough spot in my marriage, and I took the chicken way out. But I would never have hurt my wife. I never did. I never laid a hand on her, ever. But here you are in prison, and that lie may be the reason why you're and here. it might be. Because after that, the jury didn't believe you. And your own attorney stood up there and said, you're a bad guy. I'm not particularly proud of Matt Baker. He's in this spot because he kept lying, trying to stay away from being a preacher who had an affair. You told your attorney you had no affair right. with Vanessa Bulls. Why? I think that was my protecting of my kids. That was what I was telling myself, that that was a way to keep my kids safe. And, and it was wrong. But they knew about Vanessa Bulls. Vanessa Bulls wouldn't be a surprise to them. It would have been that we had any relationship, because to them there was no relationship, if that makes sense. You convinced a very skeptical, cynical attorney and a couple cynical reporters that there was no affair. How is it that a minister was so good at lying. Um, see, I didn't see myself good at lying. When I when I watched what I did watch, I could tell I wasn't telling the truth on that. I saw it in my own face. Didn't it come easy for you? No, not at all. And sometimes he wasn't that good at it. His credibility seriously strained in this exchange about shopping for those wedding rings two weeks after Carrie's death. Well, and I, I will say this, we never looked for engagement rings. She didn't try on engagement rings. If she, I, I never saw her try on engagement rings. And I'm there looking for earrings for Grace. That story's complete bogus. I read about that in the Waco Tripping Herald. We never went there for earrings. So uh, you uh, observed Matt with this blonde woman trying on rings, mm -hmm. right? So do you think Vanessa and the jewelry store shop person got together to concoct no, this story? No, if she, if she was trying on rings, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking for earrings for my daughter, so. Ah, Vanessa Bulls. What does Matt Baker think of her now? Here she is, someone who you thought was very special to you. Could have been. And in your mind, she must have been betraying you. I don't know if I honestly felt it was betrayal. I, I, that wasn't in my mind because it wasn't like we had a deal or anything like that. But when you're sitting there and you're watching her attack the very heart of your defense, right, rather effectively, what are you thinking? I'm thinking, which story do you believe? The one she tells the police, the one she tells the private investigator, every story was different. He was a complete, and still is, a manipulative liar who took me my vulnerable state and made me believe everything he said. What's her motive, Matt? What, what does she have to gain by lying? Um, I do believe that she was threatened. I do believe that she was presented with, if you don't testify against Matt Baker that will we'll arrest you for conspiracy for murder and, and prosecute you. And she was fearful of that. She was young enough and immature enough and scared enough that that's what she decided to do. And the DA gave her just enough information to make up a story. Matt Baker is hoping to find a new attorney to appeal his case on the grounds that Guy James Gray gave up on him after discovering the pastor lied about the affair. It is true Gray barely spoke to Matt during the trial and told 2020 afterwards that while he thinks Vanessa's a liar too, he had no real gripe with the jury's guilty verdict. Are you at peace with the verdict? I'm at peace with it. There is pretty substantial circumstantial evidence that he killed her. With Matt Baker in prison, his two daughters, Kenzie and Grace, are now virtual orphans living with their paternal grandparents and traveling once a month back to Waco to visit Carrie's parents. In their combined 24 years, these children have suffered the death of a sister and what they were told was the suicide and abandonment by their mother. And finally, the awful realization that their beloved father has been convicted of her murder. A custody battle is already underway between the grandparents. The most tragic victims 
those sweet, sweet babies. You took their mother and then you fed them lies, Matt. You fed them lies and then you erased her from their lives. It was not a good day for the minister. He'd been found guilty of killing his wife, sentenced to 65 years in prison, you, and then had to sit there and listen to his mother-in-law let him have it. I'm talking to you, Matt, today, okay? You haven't looked at me in almost four years. Can you look at me today? For a little while, okay? Why was it so important to you that you say to him, look at me? He has never made eye contact with me since Carrie died. He's never looked at me. I think he knew. I could see through him. And I wanted him to see me. And when I did, I don't know why, but I felt pity for him. I saw fear. Linda Doolin had been waiting four years to deliver this emotional message to her son-in-law, and it was powerful. We were so blessed to have Carrie in our lives for 31 years and how she loved us. And Matt, Matt, she loved you. But more than anything, she loved her girls. Her love for Kenzie, Cassidy and Grace was engraved on her soul. On her soul. And then you took her from us, Matt. You discarded her like she was yesterday's trash. You murdered the mother of your children. And I still can't wrap my head or my heart around this. And with that, the mother of the murdered Carrie Baker, the bubbly cheerleader who loved children so much, she not only raised her own, she taught others at the local schoolhouse, promised her daughter she would raise Kenzie and Grace not in hate, but in love. And as hard as it was for anyone in that courtroom to believe, in forgiveness. But thank goodness this journey doesn't end here. Because this isn't going to be about heartache. You see, Matt, you were never going to win this one. What you did was horrific. However, in order to heal, in order to point the way for our own granddaughters, we forgive. Because that's the only way, Matt, that love makes the way.